Welcome to Tuesday. Yes, today is Tuesday. Awesome. Um, so we are going to talk uh, again about some human AI interaction, uh, particularly in crowdsourcing. So before we do that, let me hop over to the course schedule again. So last week we, we heard from Brian. We had that, um, we discussed his paper that he did at Microsoft. And then today we read two of three papers where there's a, they kind of, I don't want to say they really built on each other, but they had different levels of sophistication that I thought was pretty interesting. And then later this week, we have a guest lecture on an expert with crowdsourcing. Don't forget exercise one is due at the end of this week. And then next week, we're going to transition into more decision-making tasks, so more reinforcement learning setting. On next Tuesday, a week from now, my friend Brad will be talking. And if you have not, if you are not really familiar with RL, it turns out there are some people in, at U of A who, who are not intimately familiar with RL. Um, but if, if you're not familiar with RL, I would recommend you watch this talk. It's, it's an hour long. You are welcome to put it on fast forward or skip ahead if it's boring. Um, or if you, if you feel comfortable with RL and think this is not worth your time, that's okay. But we will, starting with Brad's class, we'll be talking about things like policies and action value functions and policy or, or policy gradient methods. So if those, if those kind of words don't ring any bells, then it probably is worth watching this brief video. Also for next Tuesday, I'm gonna ask that you read Brad's original Tamer paper, and then there's a, uh, three other optional things if people are interested. But let's hop back to what we're doing today. Oh, before, before I go into what we're doing today, um, I just saw this, this in the news where this, this article is from Wired, where you, you probably remember a couple of years ago, a person was in a self-driving car and that car struck and killed someone. They have decided to, they, the prosecutors have decided not to prosecute Uber, but are prosecuting the, the employee that was sitting in the car and got distracted and didn't hit the stop button. So it's an interesting um, legal precedent, but I bring it up because it is human AI interaction where in this case, something bad happened and the human who is sitting there, not, not an engineer, just the poor person that they paid to do a really boring job is the one that gets hit with all the consequences. So I thought, I thought that was interesting, disappointing. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I feel, how I feel about it yet. I, in part because I don't know all the details. But if you're, if you're looking for some news to read, this is one thing you could check out after the class. I'm excited to see that there's over 100 people on Discord, and we now have over 100 people on our YouTube channel. I told my parents over the weekend I was thinking about quitting my day job and becoming a social media influencer. They didn't really go for it. If, again, if you have any questions about exercise one, drop it into the, the Discord. I know there's been some questions there and some, some comments. So that's been great. Uh, we already looked at the course schedule. But also, I've, I've started having meetings with individuals and groups about what they want to do for their course project. If you would like one of those meetings, please just do drop a meeting onto my, my schedule, uh, my scheduler, or we can always chat before or after class. Or if you prefer to submit the, the initial project um, proposal, the project write-up, and then have a discussion after that, that's totally fine too. I just want to let you know that I'm, I'm here for you. If I can be useful, just please reach out. In some classes, in sometimes in um, intro grad classes or upper level undergrad classes, I would give the class a paper and say, here, here is a research paper. You have five minutes to skim this and tell me what it's about. Now, of course, you can't, you can't read a paper in five minutes but you can get a feel for it and get a feel for whether you might want to, might want to actually read the whole thing or not. So I asked you all to 
read at least two of the three papers. And today what I'd like to do is try something that I've, I haven't done before. And that's, oh, actually it's not 20 minutes, it's 25. So I'm going to have three big breakout rooms, one for each of the papers you could have chosen to read. I'm going to ask you to jump into whichever room you want. And then you'll have about 25 minutes to decide what that paper was about, what was interesting, what you want the, the class to get out of it. So, so try to teach the class what, what that paper was about. You could guess why I chose it um, because, because not everyone has read everything. So this will be a chance for you to try to summarize a paper. 25 minutes is not no time, but it's still relatively quick. So if you want to have, you know, if you shot for like a 10 minute or maybe even seven minute presentation and then had some time for questions. So what I'm going to suggest is in each breakout room, there's someone who's uh, in charge of the shared Google Doc or Google Slides. There's one person who's going to be the one who's presenting. And when there are questions, I suggest that the presenter not be the one on the hook for answering those questions, but it's everyone in the group who's going to work to, to answer questions that come up. So this could be an absolute disaster because I've never tried it before. Um, but does this, does this kind of make sense? So if you, if you want to drop a uh, plus one into the uh, questions and comments about Mac lectures, or if you'd like, if, that, if it makes sense, or if you'd like to drop some, some questions, does, if it doesn't make sense, if the objective of this isn't clear, that would be worth, worthwhile too. Because I'm, I'm just thinking that I, I'd like to give, give you more reading than you have to do so that you are able to kind of pick and choose what you are most interested in. But if, if I'm gonna pick out papers that I think are particularly relevant, might as well spend some time going through them so that everyone gets all of that content. Okay, so I'm not getting any questions, but I am seeing a bunch of plus ones, so that's good. So let's see. So you'll remember when we, we talked about papers before, we kind of had these, these four questions. What are the take home points? What did you dislike or like? What did you find interesting? And also in particular, is there follow up work? So as you're thinking, well, if, if I took this paper as a starting point, what could be an interesting project to build on top of that? So what I'm gonna do now is try to open up, okay. So I've now opened up all the Zoom rooms and you can choose to go into one of these three rooms, either the scribe, the calendar.help, or the one I can't pronounce, Avoris, I don't know. Um, if you have not updated your Zoom client recently, you might not be able to do this. So if, if you see breakout rooms, you should be able to choose one of the three to join. If you cannot do that, then in Discord, you should drop your Zoom name and which breakout room you would like to join. And let's see how this goes. Remember, this was an experiment. This could be an absolute disaster. Hopefully it's not. Um, also, the groups are, are encouraged or welcome to just say, this is something that didn't make sense, or we don't understand this. Can you help us figure it out? That is a completely, a completely legitimate approach. So let me hand it over to breakout room one. Um, we made a Google presentation. Are we able to uh, share the screen? I hope so. Um, let me, f you, do, you do not see the green share screen? I do, I just, oh, okay, it works. Awesome. Is that visible? Yep. It is. Awesome. So, uh, we did uh, the paper on Scribe, the deep integration of human and machine intelligence to caption speech in real time. Uh, can you advance it for me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm rehearsed. Slide. Yeah. Um, Not much time, to be honest. 
So real-time text transcription is useful for uh, deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, the paper mentions that it could be useful in uh, classroom uh, lecture settings. They even mention casual conversation, um, but professional stenographers are expensive and not readily available. And uh, ASR, automatic speech recognition, has too high of an error rate uh, to be very useful um, in the real-time setting. However, graduate students <laughs> or mechanical Turks are cheap available labor and um, you can combine portions of uh, non-professional uh, captionists into a single one uh, through machine learning methods. And uh, this paper shows uh, evidence that non-experts can collectively cover speech uh, in real time at rates similar to stenographers, including for technical uh, details and, uh, and speech. Who had this part? Features. Um, I like it. You're, you're crowdsourcing the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can I can talk about this one. So, pretty much how Scribe works is that you you get the the audio data, which is then sent to a server, and it's split up amongst all these different workers who just get a small segment of the audio that they have to transcribe. And then all this comes over to the merging server and gets put together. And then there are crowd corrections that happen after that. And they get sent back in real time or somewhat real time to the user of the system. Um, so Scribe had a number of technical features uh, that we wanted to talk about uh, quickly. Uh, the big one is that it coordinates all the different captionists in real time and it manages all that for you. So instead of one person sitting down with the script and transcribing the entire thing in real time, each person gets a small portion and is coordinated and then all that work gets combined at the end. And to make this easier for people who are amateur uh, transcribers, they implemented a number of other features. So one of the notable ones was what they call time warp, which is where they'll slow down a segment of the audio that a worker is supposed to transcribe. And then to make up for that, they'll speed up the other portions. And they found that this gives people a bit of a word per minute typing boost. Um, and they also integrated ASR into this crowd captioning part. Um, and they did that by having it suggest words like an autocomplete kind of system. And then the other technical feature they had um, was how they actually aggregate all these partial captions from the different workers. Um, they talked about some other previous methods of doing this, uh, progressive alignment algorithms, graph-based alignment. Um, but what they ended up doing is a weighted A star search algorithm which we honestly did not really understand um, because they didn't really give much in terms of technical details on how they implemented that. Okay, so as we mentioned before, uh, Scrub is using uh, some cheap labor such as students to perform the real-time translation. Right. So it's cheap, but still accurate and fast because it separate the jobs to many people. So probably we have audio stream and it's, it's split into many parts and many people contribute to the same, to the translation of the same uh, audio stream, audio stream uh, simultaneously. So it's still accurate and fast. Uh, so yeah, this is an example of the combination of like a human labor and the machine intelligence. So it's also efficient the cross-sourcing because uh, in the scribe, once you assign a mission, it will be, well, once you start a task, it will be automatically assigned to many different platforms, such as, such as like a mechanical torque. And yeah, so that's why it's efficient cross-sourcing cross uh, scheme. And sometimes it can even be more accurate than the traditional stenographer because Stenographer, they probably they type really fast, 
So sometimes they are not really the expert of the area like you want to make the translation. But sometimes students know more about specific area than the uh, scenographer. So sometimes it's more accurate. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so now I guess we're, I'm going to talk a bit about what we like and dislike. Oh, I don't think the slide updated because I added a few more things. Uh, it's okay. I'll just talk about them. Um, so what we really liked was the um, potential for interleaving both human and machine work together. Um, we, we might talk about this later, but uh, they, in their future work, they mention how, oh, you could potentially use uh, ASR, ASR um, predictors themselves as one of the workers as well. So um, that adds another you know, layer of interactive machine learning to it as well. Um, and we also really liked how they talked about, they compared it to um, professional stenographers and showed how you know, um, aggregating non-professionals together actually, and, and then you know, processing that result um, actually does comparably as well in some cases. Um, and obviously, uh, this is, well, I guess the whole point of this whole thing is uh, mainly for deaf and hard of hearing individuals, and we really liked how they, they focused on uh, addressing these individuals and how this has like a real world, real world impact. Um, although on that point, um, they specifically mentioned in the introduction how deaf, deaf and hard of hearing individuals have issues with tracking captions and material that, uh, that the captions pertain to. So they kind of addressed this. So this is one point that we didn't like as much. They kind of addressed this, but uh, it seems to be more of like a fundamental issue that you know um, goes beyond the scope of this paper. Um, and obviously, something else that we didn't really like was the fact that we didn't understand their A star uh, alignment algorithm. How they how they managed to align um, the sentences together that the individuals uh, produce. Uh, next slide. So what did we find particularly interesting? Um, so I think what was really interesting, I think what we agreed on that was interesting was um, how they had this whole divide and conquer kind of approach towards uh, this one task. And they still managed to do it quite fast and efficiently um, because of this whole like dividing tasks into smaller subtasks kind of thing. Um, so on that point, it because it's a smaller task and because it's not as you know lengthy as like an, what a normal stenographer might do, um, it actually decreased costs and latency um, by like integrating this kind of machine aspect into uh, this whole system. Um, and also the idea of using time work to help am amateur transcribers, we thought that was pretty cool as well. Um, how they like slowed down certain portions and sped up others. Yeah. Finally, follow up words. Did someone? I, I forget if someone uh, was I going to take this. I'm not sure if we had anyone, but I, I could just briefly I mention it. Sure, so, sure. Um, so um, we thought it was interesting. Um, uh, Matt actually brought up in the in the Discord um, using ASR as another worker, which is something that the uh, the author suggested doing. Um, and then you could have the uh, mechanical Turkers uh, correct um, what the ASR is creating. And then uh, also they interestingly bring up using Scribe as a, um, an interactive machine learning uh, training tool uh, for ASR systems, which we thought was pretty cool as well. <laughs> yeah, and that was another note. There wasn't much ML in this system uh, besides, yeah, very, I wouldn't even call this an IML paper. It's more of a like a, you know, I don't know. I actually don't know what I would call this. But yes, thank you. That's group one for you. Nice. Yay. Yeah, so I, I think you could call that um, a human computation or crowdsourcing, definitely not interactive machine learning. But there, I think there's lots of opportunities for using I, uh, the machine learning, which I think we'll see built, built upon in the next two papers. Um, also, I'll point out that, let's see, the first paper, uh, scribe Walter was the first author, um, and his advisor Jeffrey was the last author. Author 
Jeffrey is also the last author on the third paper we'll talk about. So it's only the, the middle paper doesn't involve anyone uh, from that group. So what, uh, for other people who are not in group one, but also read this paper, what, what comments do they have? Or does anyone have any, have any other comments, things about they found interesting or, or annoying? I have yeah. one just about the, uh, they mentioned saliency at one point, and they're talking about how they kind of segmented the audio into some parts being louder and some parts being softer. I don't have much to say about that other than I felt that was weird. So was that, I can't remember, was that because they were, they were trying to come up with segments for the different workers that kind of made sense? Or is that where they are talking about you, you can sometimes come up with captions that aren't exactly the literal translation, but it's, it's very close. And if you are, if you're a domain expert, you kind of understand what that could look like, or am I completely misremembering? I understood it as sometimes when a person is talking, they're naturally putting emphasis on certain words that they think are uh, of more importance. And so they were trying to kind of like balance it out to give more salience to what are perhaps unimportant words to the speaker, but I might be out to lunch on that. Yeah, I had another, I had a point or a discussion point at least. Um, so my first thought about like this stuff is kind of um, because what the, some of the data they use was like MIT open courseware, I think, or some of the open courseware lecture stuff. And I thought like, what if I just watch YouTube and use YouTube's um, captioning stuff and um, how good would that do? So first of all, they made a point that the ASR stuff is like 50, less than 50% accurate on people's speech that it's not trained on, which I feel like is not what I've seen personally, but maybe it's improved over the past few years by that much. I was just astonished that it was like under 50% accuracy, like that bad. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And the other thing was that when they do slow down the, the sections of the speech that you're supposed to like caption or write down what they're saying, they slow it down to 50% of the speed. and from my personal experience of listening to something at 50% speed on YouTube, it's pretty atrocious. <laughs> like it, it's, it's kind of understandable, but it's not like pleasant or great. And they said they use some like special technique, but I didn't look farther into it. And I would imagine that YouTube would probably use like a similar thing. So I thought YouTube would be a pretty good comparison. So I'm like, I mean, obviously you can't hear what this, this experiment actually looks like from the paper, but I don't know how great it actually would have sounded at this 0.5 speed. You can do pitch, pitch correction and it, it can improve it somewhat, but I agree 50% seems really slow. Seems like you'd want to customize that to the worker's typing speed. Yeah, it, like maybe 50% might be slow for when you're like watching a lecture and trying to absorb things, but I guess for if you're just trying to caption things that might be, you know, it might be a, like it's, it's for a different task. So it might actually help. I've never tried those on the Cool. Thank you, group one. Um, shall we move to group two with the calendar app? Yeah, so I don't think we actually decided who's going to present. So maybe I can just start with presenting the beginning stuff. And I'm sure people in my group will have points and they can just jump in midway. Um, we also made a doc. So I'll share the doc on my screen, but I don't know how helpful that's going to be. <laughs> but we can start from there. Yeah, so everyone can see my screen, right? Cool. Okay, so this paper is, uh, what is it actually called? It's called calendar.help, designing a workflow based scheduling agent with humans in the loop. Okay, so the main idea is that like, people that are supposedly, um, I guess, rich or don't have lots of time as employees will have a person, apparently personal assistants that will just schedule things for them. 
and that saves them a lot of time in in the real world apparently and it makes sense because you don't have to like interact with others and keep sending emails trying to decide on like when to schedule times and just having like a specific person that you pay you doing this for you is quite nice but obviously like this is not something that everyone can pay for and so the goal of this paper is to make like a human-like assistant that's similar to like a real world assistant that you'd have that you'd pay for where you can just like be like hey can you like go and interact with these people and email them back and forth and decide on the time so it's more like um it has that human to human interaction and it feels a lot more natural to other people when you're scheduling a time as opposed to just maybe like sending a calendar link or something so i guess that's like the main thing that the paper is trying to address how do you do this um and so the way they do this is using ai as the main um like thing for for deciding this so all right let me give you an example so the way it works is you basically email someone like hey can we schedule a time i'm gonna cc cal and cal is the ai and cal will take it from here and then you essentially have to do nothing else and cal will continue and do the rest of the work for you and the ai which is cal will continue emailing uh, back and forth with a group or the specific person to schedule a time for you and the way it works is that the AI is capable of doing micro tasks or simple tasks for scheduling, like just a very simple meeting time or something like that. And if it gets more complex, there's a backup set of tier two and tier three humans, where the tier two is like non-experts and tier three is expert scheduling humans. And that's the main idea behind this. Um, so maybe some take home points that we had <laughs> and summarize here is that like at the beginning since it doesn't make like the system doesn't really know you or the users and stuff there's a lot of micro tasks that are kind of complex um but as the system like learns more about you it, it, it figures out that some of these tasks can be handled and that it can take over instead of like a tier two and tier three humans so it gets better with time as it learns about you and how you schedule and how you interact with others um so that's kind of powerful and the other thing is that it doesn't force people to change how they currently work in a sense. Like it, it, it's supposed to be very natural in the sense that you're just like, hey, I'll have someone that's just gonna help me out. And Cal will just interact very human-like and email back and forth. And the other person that's getting the, media, the meeting scheduled, I guess, is feels like they're kind of talking to an actual human. And that's there's some testimonies in the paper that say that this is what people felt as well, that they felt like they were actually speaking with a, with a real human. Um, so maybe some points that we liked and disliked. So we like the fact that a lot of people thought Cal was a real person. Like they even started giving Cal more and more complex tasks because they thought like, oh, it's just like any other person, like they can start handling these things and um, it's able to hopefully do these tasks. But then what we dislike about that same point in a sense is that you can kind of start taking advantage of this in the sense that you, if you know that when you give it complex tasks, you know, the AI won't handle it. And then an expert human will, you can start assigning it really complex things to do and just take advantage of the fact that, you know, you're now exploiting an expert like service uh, at the cost of like a cheaper service because the AI should be doing it for some of the time. So that's kind of um, tricky to, to handle if people start getting clever with that. <laughs> um, we also like the way that you introduce the assistant. Like it's very natural. You CC the assistant and be like, Hey, my assistant Cal is going to take this over. And sometimes people didn't even understand that this is like an AI. They thought it was an actual real person, which is kind of cool. Um, and then another point that we didn't like, <laughs> maybe we should have like made two columns, but we didn't like is the fact that there was um, no real great quantitative measure of how people enjoyed this tool. So like the people's or the user experience for this. So what, what we mean by that is they gave like testimonies of people being like, hey, this tool was awesome because it felt like a real person. Um, it was nice because it felt like it was a very natural interaction, but we don't really know what sample size of people actually said this or on average what the reviews were like. They could have just picked and chose the, the, the most interesting testimonies. So um, from a statistical perspective, I'm not sure how sound that is. Okay, um, so things that we also found particularly interesting. So we thought it was interesting that there's a tier structure, that there's like different levels of difficulties of tasks. And the way it works is if one of these tiers, like for instance, at the beginning, it's like tier one, the simplest one, if the AI is some threshold unsure, it just sends it off to the next tier. And if that tier is once again, some 
threshold level of unsure, it sends it off to the next tier and so on until it gets to tier three, which that expert has to, I guess, decide. I guess you can't, I don't think there was a case where the expert can even say like, hey, can you just go handle this on your own? I'm, I'm confused as well. So perhaps maybe something to think about as well there. Um, but that, that is nice that there's like this level of um, backups. So like if one person's unsure, there's, a, there's some source of backup. So you kind of know that you're coming to a solution regardless at some point. So it's not like you, you might be CCing this tool and sometimes you're getting back like the feedback that you're gonna have to go do it yourself anyway. So should I even be using this tool? Um, another thing is that 61% of the scheduling is done um, by not the AI, by humans, by home, <laughs> by humans, it's done by humans, not the, not the AI, which is like interesting. So over 50% is not done by the AI. So it's not like a great metric, but I guess um, as we discussed, like 39% of scheduling still being done by an AI is better than nothing. And maybe it is significant um, for someone to still use that. Okay, um, when scheduling group meetings, the scheduling is done individually. So people don't have like, it's not like it, Cal just sends out like a group email and like starts interacting with like everyone CC'd and starts picking times for everyone. It actually individually emails people and discusses with them and finds their times and then has like, I guess, like a database of like when everyone's available and then picks and ch chooses the best case. But that also had a bit of a, like there was some issues with that in the sense that there's really large groups, you're never really gonna find like a common time for everyone and then Cal can't handle that case. So then you have to send it off to an expert again. Um, and then um, people in general, or I don't know about in general, but some people mentioned the fact that they felt uncomfortable using this tool around uh, peers or employees of the same class, like level maybe at the company. Like if you're just like a very low level employee, you may feel like it's there's something wrong or like who are you to essentially be using this, this assistant tool while no one else has this tool. Like it, it might appear as if you think you're better than everyone else. Um, or this idea that you wouldn't use this with your manager or something like that because that's even it seems like it could be even worse because it's like if my manager doesn't have like an assistant and now I'm like using a personal assistant to schedule meetings, I, it, it might look very poor on my side. So people were worried to use this as the people they were emailing were more and more important. It seemed like that was a trend. Um, and then some follow up work. So one thing is to try to improve the AI aspect. <laughs> So like actually work on the machine learning side of things and the AI and the algorithms to improve it over like the 61% that are being used by people. And um, something they mentioned is that they like looked over common tasks that were sent to tier three and possibly tier two and then tried to formulate them into like smaller micro tasks. And maybe it could be like specific for certain people as it learns over time um, to improve that. And I guess that just will come with more and more data from what people are doing. And this just came to my mind as I was listening to the scribe thing, because I thought the thing that with scribe was really fascinating that I'm not sure it can be applied here, but maybe, is the fact that as scribe gets better and better, or ASR gets better and better, in scribe, you can start using ASR as the actual, like, uh, people, like, the, the, at, at, in place of the real people. And then you can use multiple ASR, like, suggestions to be combined together. Um, so maybe, like, a similar thing somehow could be used here, where you have, like, multiple AIs or something in, in the place of like the tier two thing or like a more maybe advanced AI that costs more money or is, takes more time in the place of a tier two system as it improves or something like that. But I, I like the fact that it's like the scribe was almost like future proof in the sense of like, as the ASR gets better, this algorithm is still applicable. Um, let's see what this last point is here. It was successful at integrating with people's existing behavior. Yeah, I guess this was a, the, the similar to the very beginning is that the kind of the goal of the paper is to not have another tool that people have to like spend their time learning and add to their workflow and change how they're normally structured the way they schedule meetings, but to make it very natural. And this maybe makes it more usable and actually something people will integrate into their lives. And that's it. I, I don't know if anyone in our group has any other points to make. Apparently, Vlad did a perfect summarization of that group's discussion. Good job. 
was, was that passive aggressive enough? Should I be more aggressive? Wait, <laughs> so what, a, a couple of points I wanted to raise. One of them was you're basically passing off all of the work onto the people. So it would be much better if Cal was talking to Cal because if I have to go and have a text conversation with this agent and I can't just say, dude, check out my Google Calendar, that would be kind of annoying. Yeah, that's a point I actually forgot to mention that we wrote down and I think I didn't read. Um, so that was that was one of the things we didn't like. I don't know where I put it, but anyways, it was the fact that even though you're using Cal, the people that Cal inter is interacting with, they still get the burden of having to speak with Cal and schedule their own meetings and have to interact like multiple emails trying to pick a time. So it is a burden for them. But then we thought like, as this gets better and better, can't you just have like, if people, multiple people have Cal, then Cal's themselves can just interact and pick times, which will, I guess is like nice. It's like future proofing in the sense that as more and more people use this type of tool, then it gets better and better because this interaction doesn't have to occur anymore. I also like, they had a kind of a throwaway line about how different cultures may use scheduling apps like Doodle differently. I thought that was interesting because I, that, so that's a Doodle's a website where you can go and try to find a common time. And you see some people that like have all of this time that they could allocate to this meeting if they had to, and other people will enter like three hours in the entire two week period. So I, th I thought that was kind of, kind of cool and how, how this could be useful. The one, one thing I didn't like about this paper is it wasn't clear to me how much they were actually paying people. So they, they were saying they went through, first they, they were paying minimum wage and then they were going through this um, uh, source or service that supplied people. And I, I'm worried that they could have just paid a, per, a real personal assistant to use email for these 150 people rather than setting up this whole system and paying multiple people over different times. Yeah, and they even mentioned that they kept people like, I th think, oh, maybe it was in Scribe. I'm getting mixed up, but maybe it was in Scribe, where they had people on Turk. I think it was in Scribe then. Where they, had, <laughs> they had people continually doing tasks that weren't useful as to keep them like still distracted or in, on, on the same like mind space so that when a task comes up, they're still functional. <laughs> but I think that was for Scribe and not this. So maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I think the, the interesting things about if both the person have Cal, uh, will the Cal go look for Cal for scheduling or the Cal will go look the other person for scheduling? And you might get into some interesting um, uh, dead end loops. So if there's um, a, a chat bot called Cleverbot, and there is this amazing video from about five years ago where two instances of Cleverbot were talking to each other and they ended up arguing about God kind of just by mistake. It was, it was surreal. Yeah, I was going to ask this group, like how pleasant is it for the people on the other side to interact with Cal? Like, does it feel like you're talking to th this robot who doesn't understand anything you're saying? Or is it more natural? Yeah, so there was I think it. Go ahead. Oh, I just, I, if you want to talk loud, it's okay. But um, I think, uh, maybe I'm wrong on my point, but I think most people thought it felt pretty natural. Cause I mean, two thirds of the time, assuming equal distribution of which tier of the system you're talking to are people. Um, the one complaint that I don't know if we mentioned at this point was that I think one of the criticisms that people had was that it was a bit too pushy and I guess Cal was kind of trying to force people to like select times or emailing them to ask for times at odd moments. Yeah, so exactly um, in Vlad's screen share. Um, it's a bit pushy, but it, yeah. To answer your question, yes, people thought, I think for the most part, it felt natural, which I would hope makes sense with how the system was designed. But... Okay, thanks. And it's also interesting to, to think about should is, is it a good thing if people think they're talking to a human but are actually talking to an AI? Is that is that a feature or a bug? Because you could probably argue it either way. Yeah, or the other thing that I, I like that Michael mentioned there again is that 
they said that they like first of all they picked out testimonies and second of all 60 over 60 percent of the time they were actually talking to humans so <laughs> like maybe the testimonies were the cases where they actually interacted with humans so it didn't really like i don't know how much it meet like i don't know if they picked out testimonies specifically when it was the ai case right i don't know if they filtered for that so maybe it was every time where it was an expert so i don't know if it means anything All right, so I think I'm going to steal the screen share and I will present the first slide and then I'll let um, my uh, colleagues in Zoom room three present the other slides. We were looking at the crowd powered conversational assistant. And I think this, this was probably the most ML related where Scribe, Scribe was not really using ML. Calendar was, was figuring out how to automate things and trying to, to speed things up a bit. And this seemed to be the, the, the best positioned inside the IML setting. So who, who would like to present this slide, what we were thinking about? I can talk about some stuff. Uh, so, in general, this was to have a general chat bot that works with kind of any, any human input and it's supposed to get better over time, both from how you've used it before and if they find kind of similar users or similar questions, it can, can reuse or learn from previous responses. So there's, they had a bunch of stuff on kind of different ML stuff that can be plugged in and then some things on information retrieval to find uh, close matches to stuff that you have done before. So they want to brag about their architecture and um, their kind of modular multiple chatbot design how things can be voted on and then how they successfully uh, push this out for, for people to use. And it is stressed that only 80, 80 participants and I think something like 300 conversations uh, were logged in their, in their deployment. But I think also like calendar.help, actually like all of these things, they were all kind of trying to stress the modular, we're using crowdsourcing and we're using people right now, but the idea is that you slowly phase out the humans once you have a, in this case, chat bot, but some sort of AI that can do a very simple task. As soon as it gets close to what a human can do, then you can substitute that thing in and then just kind of always have the human overlord at the end who can uh, yay or nay certain actions. Well, and that's, that's a good point. I forgot to, to specifically mention in the calendar to help that they had this four study design. They started off with Wizard of Oz, where it's just people. Then they moved into uh, trying to get things a little more usable and then they actually use the more automated system. And that, that was one of the nice things I think about this approach where they were trying to try to use previous data, use humans, and then build up the sophistication over time, just like Graham was saying. Should I talk about these four points more or uh, just kind of get to them as they show up in later slides? Let's get to them as they show up. Sure. Let's go next slide then. Okay, so I'd say this is more or less their architecture, which is on the left, we have a whole bunch of bots. And after a user has given uh, this system some question, all of these bots might be suggesting possible responses. And so these bots can be anything from a Yelp bot that is just gonna be yelling out different restaurants that they think are uh, apropos or like a weather bot or anything like that. 
or it could be an information retrieval bot to say, we've already had a question like this, and this is the answer that worked that time. So they all propose responses, and then uh, uh, you also have people that can propose responses, and then it, all these responses kind of enter uh, a voting round where uh, a response gets upvotes and downvotes, and once it meets some particular threshold, that will be sent back to the user as uh, a reply. And uh, I guess it's worth mentioning that multiple things can be sent back to the user because it's all about a threshold. It's not like it was a multiple choice option where they're choosing one of the 10 or however many proposed responses. Um, and so e each part is automatable. They have both people that can upvote and downvote, and they also have bots that can upvote and, and downvote. Uh, next slide. So for sure, for related work, it's kind of any chunk of this that is kind of a, a modular piece. So there's the dialogue systems, any kind of NLP related thing to either do like named entity recognition or linking on, on the sentences given, or it's um, uh, like intention and any kind of thing to figure out what the user's input was, was all about. And uh, they mention a couple, uh, so Matt mentioned er earlier Cleverbot. Cleverbot was one of their four chatbots that they have kind of integrated into this or at least used, um, as well as uh, two that I mentioned, the Yelp bot and I think it was a, a weather bot. Um, so just prior things that have been shown to work to some degree, they're able to just kind of incorporate any of those things into here. Uh, so that their their voting system can kind of have the uh, the best the best come out. Next slide. So I, I find this is kind of a weird use case of it. Um, in the so there's the kind of square box that's the interface for the person, and the person has entered in. Can you find some good restaurants in Pittsburgh? And the, uh, oh, this isn't the one I was thinking of actually. Uh, but uh, so various responses come in. The One of the chatbots comes in and just says, what kind of food do you want? And then you have the crowd results for the, for the, other, the other three. And then a user is able to select the one that they, they like. And I cannot understand how sure wait a minute is the one that a user would be happy with. So I don't know if, if anyone else read this paper and understood what they're trying to figure out with that. That's not, like unless that was actually linked to also the correct information uh, I find that the most curious thing to include in this paper. When something like, what kind of food do you want, I think is far better. Yeah, unless, unless that person is thinking, oh, I'm going to go run to Yelp and choose the top three restaurants in Pittsburgh, and that's going to take me 15 seconds. Yeah. But even then, that would be kind of weird. Yeah, and, and so if if it's somehow like, linked back to, oh, we also had that result and he did come back with the, the proper result. So I'll also click his sure, wait a minute is good. Um, hmm. Yeah, so um, on the right, we have what the person, the, the user of the system actually sees. And then on the left is the back end for, for what's up happening on the kind of the, uh, the, the suggestions and the, the voting. So a, a person wants a Chinese restaurant and the Yelp bot jumps in and send, says, says some stuff. 
the blue arrow means that it, it did pass that threshold. So it, it is sent back. And then we get an example of a couple things where the random bot just sends a smiley face and people downvoted that so it wasn't sent back. I have no idea why. Uh, and then the uh, one worker doesn't have a good question, it's downvoted, and you get a bunch of possible, possible responses that might be helpful. In this case, there's no back and forth though. So I, I think it would have been a little bit interesting to see um, like if the third one, the Shanghai restaurant is located at blah, blah, blah. If that one wasn't sent and the user was not satisfied with what they got, I would have liked to see actually what happens when there is a bit of a back and forth where they do respond to some of these questions. So like one worker says, are you looking for a Chinese restaurant in, and then they specify to make sure that it's not a different Durham or um, yeah, just a bit of a back and forth because it seems like three, two or two or three of these were not really helpful answers to the question, uh, but they were all sent because they met the threshold but the person was satisfied, so uh, it's deemed like an acceptable interaction. Well, and this, this does a nice job of showing you get uh, input from different bots. So those could be learning and improving over time. You get newer bots, but this doesn't really show how the picking what to send could also be done by bots. It's, it's not clear whether the workers are the ones making those blue arrows, or if it's a combination of human workers and automated banded algorithms. And what was, because in the, the previous figure, there was someone that accepted something. And I was also a little unclear if this is, my assumption, this is the actual user of the service. And so they're actually able to select one. They, they liked, sure, wait a minute. But in the one that we're looking at right now, it doesn't show them selecting one of them. And it would make a lot more sense to me in this figure if, let's say they really like the, the second or the third option, the new walk-in or the Shanghai restaurant. If they selected one of those as like, that was my preferred answer, and then they, they sign off the service, then you've at least given the bots some information to, uh, to learn from and say, okay, this is when a person asks this kind of a question, this is the accepted answer. But now you have bots that are maybe learning, are any of those suggestions acceptable or would you like some more? What's stopping them from to learn from that and say, okay, when a person asks for something, I'll just immediately ask them if the suggestions that I haven't already given are acceptable. Maybe that's a, a weird, a weird edge case. But. Yeah, and then hopefully the human workers would would downvote that. Um, oh, and the other thing I want to mention is they do they do have uh, a, a reference to uh, epsilon greedy exploration, where they do try to throw in suggestions from random bots so that you can figure out if and when they're useful. Like the smiley face. Yeah, not useful. Well. Um, so let's see, we've got two slides left and negative one minutes. Um, so mate, Graham, would you be willing to go through this, the last two kind of quick? Uh, sure. So like, dislike, uh, we liked how, we liked the voting system. We liked that it used past stuff to improve current stuff. We like the modular design so you can have expert bots not designed by them, but just kind of slapped into the middle of it. Uh, the explorations, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the greedy, greedy epsilon. I'm not very RL, so I kind of know what that means. Um, is it, so it's difficult to tell how useful it is. And we also don't know uh, time, uh, what kind of time deltas we're dealing with. So if I ask for a restaurant, does it come back with an answer in 15 seconds, five minutes? We don't, they don't really ever say. Um, and yeah, what I said before about having better examples with more back and forth. And um, another problem with these kind of human interaction systems is 
you can't just download their GitHub and test it out, right? You'd need, you'd need to set it up and get a bunch of Turkers or get a bunch of friends. So it's, it's hard to replicate results or understand how the system work could be hard to replicate results. Uh, latency, which I said, and then ignoring repeated suggestions. So they had, so I can't remember if it was this paper or another one, they had something that said that if a user keeps on putting in the same response, they'll start to ignore it because uh, they're either stuck in a rut or they're just trying to grief the, the system a little bit. Uh, make bots to go on Mechanical Turk. I'm not entirely sure. Remember we said we wanted to, to uh, use oh. a system that could go and be a Turker. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be funny. To, to The whole point of Mechanical Turk is to get people, but I think it would be funny if we made a bot to go on Mechanical Turk uh, just to kind of troll all of research. <laughs> okay. So thanks for doing that, Graham. Um, I would be very interested to know if people found this interesting, if this was annoying, if this was useful, if they thought it was a waste of time. So I'll, I'll try to drop a uh, survey into Discord. And if you could respond to that, if you'd like to uh, send me anonymous email or any, any comments would be really useful. Because this is the first time I've done this kind of thing. I enjoyed it, but I'm, I'm not the audience, right? This needs to be useful for you guys. Not, it's not about whether I enjoyed it or not. So anyway, uh, thank you for participating in this this experiment. Uh, it was it was nice to crowdsource presentations, and I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. <laughs>